So, all right. So, you know, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me today. And, um, you know, this is, this is the joy of birding, a beginner's guide to, um, to birding. And um, you know, I'd like to give special thanks to Carol and Merrick for um, inviting me to give this talk. I really appreciate it. So I'm just gonna you know, jump right in. So just a brief introduction. Uh, sorry about that. So just a brief introduction. Of, you know, I'm I'm Skylar Lawson. Um, originally an um, Alabama native. You know, I've lived in uh, Buffalo, New York for over you know three years. Um, I moved here for college. You know, I, I moved here for a psychology. Um, you know, master's program, and you know, I finished that in, in 2019, and now I'm trying to pursue a doctorate in um, public health. I'm, um, I'm, I've, been, I've been a member of the Buffalo Ornithological Society for, uh, I'll say, a little over a year, and you know, I'm a pretty avid birder and a kind of you know, amateur bird and nature photographer. By no means an expert, but you know, I'm pretty passionate about it, and that's why I'm here to kind of share, you know, my experiences, and hopefully that'll inspire some people to, to get into the hobby. Also, you know, I'm really you know, big time foodie. So I do, I do enjoy trying different types of food. And, you know, Buffalo is great for that. They have a pretty diverse um, food scene. All right. So some, some you know, this, for this presentation, I have some objectives. You know, you know, first things first, you know, compelling reasons for birding, you know, you know physical health, mental health benefits, other, other reasons. I'm also going to give you an overview of the essential equipment you'll need for, for birding. So, you know, binoculars, field guides, and also to some free apps that will come in handy too if you don't want to you know, shell out the money for the uh, field guides. Also, I have some uh, tips on how to strategically plan your birding trips to make the most out of the, the trips. And also, I also have some, uh, some, uh, you know, some ways to distinguish bird songs from bird calls. You know, you'll, I think you'll, you'll find that pretty interesting. Also, um, what's really fun is there actually some citizen science opportunities available where you can actually become, you know, a, you know kind of a, a boots on the ground type scientist that collects data for ornithologists and other natural scientists. And I'll get into more details about that too. And also I'm gonna just kind of give some quick facts about some common North American birds. And after that, there'll be a Q&A se uh, session. Also too, um, you know, on every slide, just about every slide, there's um, kind of a picture on the le bottom left of a bird that I've encountered. And uh, you know, those are some of the pictures that I take, so you can kind of enjoy those too. I, to, I had them in there just so you can see kind of the diversity of the bird kingdom, within, even with, just within North, North America. It's just kind of a slice of the overall bird diversity. All right, so before we get started, uh, I just want to go over you know, terminology. So you know, the terms uh, bird watching, and birding, they're normally used interchangeably, but um, and I think I think you know for, for the purpose of this presentation, we'll just use birding because bird, you know, bird watching is more than just seeing. It's a, it's a big you know hearing component to it as well. You know, a lot of times you'll you'll have birds that you you probably won't see, but you if you know if you know what they sound like, if you if you understand what calls they make and what songs they make, you can identify them without even having to see them, which is pretty nice. And um, you know, we'll we'll talk about that too later on in the uh, presentation. All right, so positive benefits of birding. Uh, there are many. So for one, um, it's an opportunity to gain a richer understanding of the diverse kingdom of animals that you know, play a big role in nature's soundtrack. I mean, everyone in here has heard you know, birds in their backyard or in some kind of environment before. And just getting into this hobby, you kind of learn more about you know, how they live their daily lives and what impact they have on their particular ecosystem. Um, also too, for birding, it's a, it's a low impact form of physical activity that encourages purposeful movement and what do I mean by purposeful movement? You know, instead of just, you know, walking, you can actually kind of, um, you, you can actually walk with an added purpose that'll maybe even motivate you to walk more, you, you know, walking for the sake of um, encountering, you know, birds and um, kind of learning more about the different species out there. And it can be as, you know, it can be as strenuous or as, as, or as, um, as low impact as you like it to be. You can, you know, bird for, you know, 20 minutes. You can bird from a stationary position. Like, for example, you're looking, looking at the windows into your backyard or you can, you gotta be crazy like me and go out there and walk around for like four hours looking for birds and taking pictures. So it's, it's really up to you. You decide your own trip and you make the most out of it and you, you just go at your own pace. So I think it's, I think it's very, um, a very, it's a very kind of inclusive, you know, hobby in that, in that respect. And also too, I think it's, I think it's available to um, a broad range of income levels. You know, you know, binoculars may be the more expensive item, but you can find some. You can find some, you know, re, um, reasonably priced binoculars for a decent price, either used or perhaps on you know, like an online retailer, retailer on Amazon. That'll 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 be very helpful. With regard to like um, field guides or the books you need, those can be those can be acquired through the library system. You know, if you if you have access to the library, 
And also too, there are free bird identification apps available that you could use as well to kind of, you know, kind of avoid some of the more expensive aspects of birding. So I think, I think that makes it more available to a, a wide variety of people. I also, I also think that, you know, the, the uh, you know, birding can be pretty uh, disability friendly too. You know, I, you know as, as a friend I know that actually, you know, he actually does photography and he's uh, wheelchair bound. So depending on the location you go to and how you know, well manicured the park is or the nature trail, you can actually still be able to access it that way. So it is, it is open to a wide range of people of different abilities, ages, and Oops, Skylar, I think you froze there. So it kind of goes to show how, um, you know, how, how a lot of people could, you know, be able to do it just you know, at their own pace and still get a lot out of it. And lastly, um, you know, birding has the potential to make you feel more connected with nature and other forms of wildlife. I can't tell you how many times I've gone out into the field and encountered um, not just birds, but foxes and, you know, white-tailed deer or, um, you know, you know, woodchucks and other animals that I normally wouldn't, you know, pay attention to or see had I not been out there in the field kind of, you know, birding. So I think that's a good benefit of, of, of birding as well. All right. All right, so um, essential birding equipment. So number one, binoculars. Those are a very important tool for identifying birds. And, um, you know, before purchasing a pair, there's some things you have to consider, particularly the numbering system on binoculars. For example, um, consider like eight by 42. So the number eight refers to magnification power. And, you know, it's, you know, simply put, the object appears eight times closer than when viewed by the naked eye. And the number 42 refers to the aperture. And that's sort of a measure of how much light that the, the, your binoculars are able to gather. And that's not as important for birders. What's, what, that's more important for people that are doing, you know, astronomical observations or trying to see celestial bodies. For birders, that, that number should be around like 42 or 50. I think that's, that's pretty fine. So, so in general, like for, for birding, the, the normal ranges that I use are, you know, eight by 42, 10, you know, 10 by 42, eight by 50, 10 by 50. You could, you could go higher in magnification, but just be mindful that the higher you go in magnification, the higher you're gonna go in price. So just, just keep that in mind, because that's, you know, more magnification comes with more price. And, and if you want to go even further, they have telescopes available for, you know, stationary birding. If you want to see really far, those are, those are more expensive too. But, you know, as you become more obsessed like me, maybe you'll, you'll save money and try to get that later on. All right. And um, also, if you wear glasses, um, check to see if the binoculars have retractable eye cups that, um, that make it more comfortable to, to, to use binoculars while wearing glasses. And I'll, and I'll show you what it looks like because I have a diagram on the, uh, the next page. I think they're a pretty good option. And also to um, another option is um, if you want another option for identifying birding is um, a digital camera, but those those can be more expensive. But you know, I, I got one because initially I was I was kind of obsessed with trying to identify these birds that fly away so quickly that I, you know I look at them in my binoculars and they fly away. So you know now I, now I'm able to take pictures and identify them when I get home or while I'm out in the field, which is pretty nice. So that'll give you a future investment for you too if you you know, if you really want to get into it. All right. So you know, here's a here's a basic diagram of binoculars. Um, as you can see, as you can see um, in the middle here, you have the uh, the main focus knob, and that's what you'll be turning as you're looking through it to make sure that the image is not fuzzy. It kind of keeps it in focus because depending on what distance you're looking from, it, it'll be blurry. So if you turn it in a certain direction, it'll it'll clear up. You also have the eye cups here that can be twisted out for viewing, you know, with the, with, with or without glasses. So you you can try both settings with them with them in or out and see what feels best for you. Um, you know, of course, there's the, of course, there's the uh, shoulder strap attachment here. You kind of, you'll have, you have something that allows you to put it over your neck. Like I'll, you know, I have a, have a pair here. I have the, you know, the attachment that just helps it goes out, go over. Also, too, um, you, you, you want to take note of um, an important part of using binoculars is, um, so when you're, when you're looking through them, you want to make sure that you're only seeing like one hole. Because if you're looking through them wrong, it'll, it'll like you have double vision. So just know that you can actually, you can actually fold them. They, they can be bent, you know, they can, they can kind of go up and down just to kind of, to kind of fit, you know, the, how far apart your eyes are. So you're gonna, you're gonna wanna kind of toggle that into it seems like you're just looking through one hole. And you'll know, because if you're looking through them wrong, it's gonna look disorienting. So you'll definitely, you'll definitely become adjusted to that with time. Another, another very important tip, that, a tip that's, um, it's really simple, but it's gonna help you out a lot is, 
whenever you see a bird in the field and you have your binoculars around your neck, what, you, what you're gonna wanna do, and you, you know, the first thing you, you're probably tempted to do is look down and reach for your binoculars. Instead, keep your eye on the bird and bring the binoculars up to your eyes and look at the bird. There, you know, therefore, you won't lose what you're looking at because it's really, really easy to, to lose track of a bird that's buried in a bunch of foliage or on a tree with multiple branches. So keep your eyes on the bird and bring the binoculars up to your face as you're looking there. And you'll, it'll save you some trouble because they, they can be really hard to spot. All right, so next. Okay, so this is optional. This is an optional book, but it's, I think it's really good. This is um, Sibley's Birding Basics. And that's um, it's, it's from David Sibley. He's a very um, popular um, American birder. You know, he, you know, he, he um, breaks it down and he breaks down the uh, essentials of birding pretty well in this easy to read book. It covers anatomy. It covers, covers some principles for identifying different types of birds. And also too, it's, it's full of his, his, his elaborate hand-drawn illustrations of all the birds. And it's, it's, it's very helpful, I think, to, if you're really getting into it and you want to kind of learn more about the kind of the principles behind it and different approaches at doing it. You know, I actually have a copy right here with me. It's very, very good book. It's pretty, it's pretty light read. I mean, it's not that, not that thick at all. You could, you could finish it in a day if you wanted to. So definitely something I recommend, but it's optional. And you know, if you if you don't want to shell out the money for it, it's probably available at your local library. That's an option too. So all right, we're going to move on to field guides. So you know, if, if birding was a religion, you know, field guides would be the holy books. You know, field guides you know provide you with detailed illustrations and comprehensive information about birds in a particular region. And this can and this could be you know birds of North America or birds of North the Northeast or the West. So you want you're going to want to search for something that corresponds to where you live. For example, I have here, I have Sibley's Birds of the East, because I live in, you know, I live in the Northeast. So this has a, a kind of a comprehensive list of the different types of birds, you know, your, um, your thrushes, your, your, um, your, your, you know, just the different types, uh, your waterfowl. And I can use that to, to help me identify birds in the field, because they're all, it's the convenient thing is that on the, the very, the very similar types of birds are all together on, in different chapters and, and sections, so I can look at them and compare the subtle differences and make my decision that way. And Sibley's is really good for that, because it has those elaborate illustrations. Peterson's really good, too. That's another one of the uh, popular uh, field guides you could use for that. There's also, um, National, Ge National Geographic also has uh, its own field guide too. I think that covers North America that, that I think will be worth checking out as well. So yeah, field guides are a really good tool for using out in the field. But I also have another tool that's you know pretty good too that doesn't cost any money. Bird identification apps. So you know with the advent of smartphones, you know, birding's been made a bit simpler and a bit more convenient. You know, there are a handful of free um, bird ID apps that will help you you know, during your, um, during your birding excursions. Two of my favorites are the Audubon app and the Merlin Bird ID app. And, I was gonna, and I'm gonna show you some, uh, some brief videos on how they work. So just give me one second. This may, be, this may be a little, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and, and reshare. Let's see, if it'll, let's see if it'll work. Okay. I'm going to play the video in just a moment. All right, can everyone see the video? Merlin is a free app that uses five yes. questions Great. to identify the birds you find, providing real time bird ID guidance right in the palm of your hand. This is such a cool app, you'll just have to see it in action. Let's say you were out birding and you see a beautiful small round.
Hey, Scott. Sorry. So Skylar, I'm sorry, I think um, somebody was unmuting to say the same thing. Uh, we're having a hard time hearing it. So if you want to narrate what it's doing. Okay, so it's, not, it's not coming through. No, not, not the sound. Not the sound. Oh, no. Okay. Let me see if I can fix that. The sound's not coming through. Uh-uh. Hmm. Let's see if this helps. All right, one more time. Still the same? We can hear that. Yes, we can hear it. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Now it's hard to hear again. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So it's still so you can narrate it. Okay, so from for this app, essentially, um, you know, if you put in your, you, you know, if you see a bird, you, you, you know, you put in your location of where you are, and um, you know, when you see the bird, and um, you know, it automatically populate today's date, and then you, you know, you pick your date, you pick your location, and then you can determine what size the bird is, for example, and you know, if it's a sparrow size, is it, is it, um, is it, is a goose size? Is it, is it um, robin size or something in between? You can use those to kind of help out. And you know, just putting your your best estimate, and that's that'll be that'll be very helpful. And then you select you know your colors, and you can pick up to three colors for the bird that you saw. So yeah, just pick three of the most you know prominent colors, and that should help narrow down the list of potential birds that the um, the app will pull up for you based on your location and what time of year it is. And also, you know, you want to put what what activity the bird was engaged in. You know, was that a feeder? Was it swimming? Was it soaring? And that's it. Yep, and then it's going to generate a list of uh, possible birds for you. Yep, and there's, there it is, a barn swallow. You know, based on the based on the characteristics you put in and what location you're in, and also that you can listen to the audio of the different songs and calls that it makes, just to confirm it. And there's a list of other birds too as you scroll down. You can also you can also take pictures of birds with your phone, and it can it can help you ID it too with the photo ID feature. Yep, just like that. Yep, confirm your location and date, and then you can identify, and then should pull up the same bird. There it is. So yeah, so that's that's one of two apps, and I'm and I'm sorry that there's audio issues. wasn't it? wasn't expecting that. Um, let's see. Can I find the other one? Um, let's see. Can you can you still see my screen as far as um, YouTube is concerned? Yes. Okay, you can still see my screen. Okay, let me see. I'm gonna try with the audio again. Let's see if I can just switch something up with my audio and um. In Zoom. Okay. Something else and see if that works. And just let me know if it doesn't work. And then I'll just I'll, I'll just have to narrate again, which I'm fine with. Okay. So I'm gonna try to play this. Can you, okay, can you see my screen where it says the uh, Audubon bird ID? Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna play. Let's see if it. Let's see if you can hear it. Bird ID is a powerful tool. 
That's better. Just make it loud if you can. By showing you only birds you likely to be seen in your area during yes. Actually, Skylar, it's going in and out. I'm sorry. You want to just turn off the sound and narrate? So for this one, um, this is actually my favorite one. You um. You can so as it's showing here. You um you can you can look up you know different different birds by using the explore feature on on this on the Audubon app, and you know what you can do too is um if you if you see a bird you can click the uh you, you know you, the, the the part where it says you know saw, saw a bird you don't recognize and let me let me see if I can scroll to the part where it does that back here yeah here we go so the most important takeaway is this part right here. Which is which is similar to the um, the Merlin bird ID app, but it's more it goes into way more detail. Because you, you can you, you can pick the different you know different sizes, different colors, different types of birds, what they're doing, their habitat, what they what they sounded like, their wing shape, their tail shape, and then you know as as you're as you're adding all these different characteristics, you can see here at the bottom you know it, it should, you know the possibilities of the possible matches should shrink as your specificity goes up. And you know it's really it's really useful for picking the correct bird, and also too, as as you have your list of pop possible options for each option you go to, you can actually play that bird's bird song, that bird's calls. So you can use that. To, you can listen to those and say, okay, that, that that sounds like what I'm seeing, or that or that sounds like what I'm hearing. So this this app, the Audubon app, it's very very detailed, and you can actually use it as a way to help you um, you know memorize the different types of bird songs there are, just to kind of learn. Learn and just just to learn it, to recognize them without even seeing them, but just by you know how they sound, and that's um I think that's really beneficial. So um another another important feature of this is uh let me let me see just the it just has a vast library of birds. I mean it's just, there's there's um I believe um hundreds if not thousands of birds listed in the app alone, and it's it, it's it's a free app just like the other app. It's free, so I definitely advise you to take advantage of the app if you can because it's it's really worthwhile, and and um, and since and, you know, since you're not able to hear my audio, definitely um, you know, if you're able to check out the video, just you know, look up the Audubon Bird app or the uh, the Merlin Bird ID app, and it'll it'll give you kind of a brief introduction of that. So I'm just gonna just gonna skip ahead since that's not that's not cooperating. So let me I'm gonna reshare my uh my PowerPoint screen. Okay. All right. So next, um, next something that's something that's you know hugely important is um just knowing how to, knowing how to plan your uh, your birding trips. So you know a popular question is you know what are the, what are the best times of going out for birding? You know you know almost almost any time is um good for birding, but there are some optimal times that you want to consider if you want to see like the most amount of birds. So think about um, dawn and dusk. So um, for example, um, last Saturday, um, I went out birding with a, a couple of people. We, we went around like um, sunrise and we saw, we saw hundreds of birds. It was just, it, it's, 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 it's around the time where they wake up because you know, these, these, these birds are, you know, you know, the birds that we're interested in are diurnal. You know, they wake up, they kind of have the same sleep cycle as we do. So you want to you wanna catch them when they're waking up and they're starting their day. You know, they're going to be foraging and they're going to be you know, singing and they're just most active at that time of day. I've I've gone birding midday before. It, it's it's been kind of mixed. I mean, I've had times where I hardly saw anything, and times where I see stuff. So, almost any time is good. But it's you know optimal times around you know dawn and dusk. Dusk is a really interesting time because the daytime birds are getting their last meals before they go to sleep, and also too you you also have a chance of seeing some uh, some nocturnal birds, which is which which is pretty interesting. So that's another time to consider when you're going out. So another important question is, you know, where do I go birding? Um, the best places I'd say are, you know, nature trails, state parks, nature preserves, you know, nearby like um, large bodies of waters like creeks and streams and lakes, and also to even your own backyard. If, you, if you're interested, you could, you know, transform your backyard into, um, you know, you can, have, you can install bird feeders. 
and, they, and that can be a you know, varying price. It's just a way to kind of bring the birds to you. And um, another, another big question is how do I find you know, birding hotspots? And I'll, and I'll show you how that works. Just give me one second. There's actually a website that's pretty easy to use. It'll show you like, the, the best way to find the, the best birding spots in your location. So thankfully, this, this doesn't involve audio, so we don't have to worry about any audio issues. Let's so just one moment. Share my screen. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. Yes. So this is eBird.org, which is a very amazing website. It's essentially it's a global repository of bird sightings, you know, collected by you know birders across the world, and it's you know it's used by ornithologists and other natural scientists to to you know to do to understand bird populations, my bird migration, and also help it helps with bird conservation efforts. You know, the way I use it is that you know before I plan on going somewhere, you know, I click on the Explore tab here. And I go to explore regions. And you know, an easy way to do it is you just type in your county. For me, that's Erie County, New York. And you know, and this is cool, it lets you know how many species have been observed in Erie County. So that's a, that's a nice size. It makes me happy. How many, you know, the total number of checklists that have been done there. You know, checklist is essentially a list of you know bird sightings, bird sightings that someone has done and submitted to eBird. And you know the number of people that are, you know eBirders in Erie County, but what we're what we're interested in is the uh, hotspots. So you just click here, and this gives me a wealth of information about places I could potentially go to to see birds, and also it lets me know how many species have been seen there. For example, this is a really popular place, Tip Nature Preserve. You know, 261 species of birds have been spotted there. That's that's incredible. So that's a place that you know I definitely want to go to to see you know. Hey, you know, I have a good chance seeing something nice if I go there. And you know, the list goes on and on of, of different places. And the same, the same will probably be true for the county that you live in. You know, just type it in there and check it out, and you'll you'll see like, okay, now now I know where I should go. You know, these are the places where I'll find something interesting. And it may be places that you don't even expect. For example, you know, Forest Lawn Cemetery. You know, so you know, different different kind of unique locations or. Where is that? University of Buffalo, you know, my university. That's a that's a birding hotspot. There are a lot of birds there. So definitely check out ebird.org and you know look for hotspots in your area before you plan your birding trips. You you won't regret it. All right, so I'm gonna, gonna keep on going. I'm gonna pull my PowerPoint back up. Let's see. There we go. So, so the next one is, um, you know, learning bird songs and bird calls, which are, you know, very different. So, um, so birds communicate in a variety of ways. Um, some of the most pro prominent communication methods are bird songs and bird calls. And, um, you know, bird songs can be distinguished by their musicality. You have some, you know, varying tones and melodies, whereas, um, whereas bird calls tend to be less musical and more repetitive in nature. So bird songs are typically typically used to defend territory and also to attract mates, whereas you know bird calls are used for you know other forms of communication like alerting the presence of you know predators. And learning these distinctive uh, sounds can aid you in identifying birds without even having to see them, because every bird has its own you know, distinctive sound. Not every bird has a song, but I'd say virtually every bird has calls. So learn those, and you'll, it'll be easier for you to figure out wh what you're hearing. All right, so let's see. So there is a, I'm not gonna try to play this because it's probably not gonna work, but there is, um, the University of Cornell has a free, um, a free sort of um, game available on their website called um, Birdsong Hero. And essentially it allows you to identify birds based on their songs in a multiple choice like fashion. So essentially you'll, you'll hear a bird song, you'll be given three choices. And you, you can actually visually see the song through what's called a spectrogram. And that's, that's a kind of a visual representation of the sound. You know, you know, the thicker the bars, the louder the sound is. And you, and, you can, and you can use that as a tool to kind of memorize, you know, bird songs. So repeatedly, repeatedly quiz yourself on Bird Song Hero and it'll, it'll help you, um, you know, learn, it'll help you memorize bird songs. And it'll be easier for you to do birding by ear out in the field. So, 
I wonder if this I wonder if this will work. Let me let me just try it one time. If not, I'm just gonna skip through it. So this is because I have some examples of bird songs and your bird calls. We'll, we'll see if this works, hopefully. Yes. Okay. That's good. So this is a male American goldfinch and it's uh, singing. Notice how it's kind of a more of a musical nature. Kind of rich, little rich melodies there. And you can still hear it pretty well. Yeah, it, Zoom is doing what Zoom does. It's a little choppy, um, both visually and auditorily, but I think we get the gist. Yeah. Okay, at least at least the gist is coming through. So it won't it won't sound choppy and like it won't sound choppy in the field, but yeah, but at least you, at least you get the gist of it. <laughs> All right, so um, we'll move on to example number two, as long as it's not too bad. So this one's a song sparrow, very common throughout North America, and they have a very distinctive song that you, you may have heard before. And it, it, it comes later on, it kind of comes towards the end of it. Hopefully, hopefully it comes through clearly. So yeah, that's an example of you know song sparrow song. So definitely not not repetitive. Very very kind of um, it has a musical quality to it. So next we have something another song by the uh, gray cat bird. And I hope here goes. So, so the great the great cat bird is a unique case. Um, so, they, although they have bird songs, they tend to be very chaotic and disorganized. They actually I actually borrow a lot of songs from other birds and kind of mash it all together. So they have sort of a improv like bird song. They're actually in the mockingbird family, and that makes sense to me because they're they're very yeah they <laughs> they make some very interesting sounds. So now we're going to look at some examples of uh, bird calls. And we, again, we're going to show the cat bird now, and I'll, you'll, you'll, from this, you'll learn why it's called a cat bird. It's probably a familiar sound to cat owners. Yeah, that's um that's an example of like a bird call. Not as musical, very repetitive. So you know, very different from a bird song. At example number two, we have the male northern cardinal. That chipping sound. It's funny because you, you, hear, you hear it multiple times. It's actually communicating with another cardinal, a female that's um, not in the image. So you kind of see how this kind of the, the back and forth dynamic with that call as opposed to like a, a song. And our last example is um, a female American goldfinch, you know, emitting some calls. Let's see if it plays. Here we go. So it's 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 musical like a bird song, but it lacks the complex the complexity of your usual bird song. So, and also too, you'll you'll see birds that um that tend to make calls while they fly. Those are called flight calls, and you'll you'll see them as they fly. They're just constantly making a sound. One that one that one that you all are probably familiar with is the Canada goose. I mean, they're always making noise. So that's not that's not a song. That's those are calls. <laughs> you know, the, the loud honking sound. <laughs> all right, so. 
All right, we can move on to you know citizen science opportunities, and this gets back into eBird. So if you're interested in being a citizen scientist, then download the eBird app on your phone. And when I say citizen science scientist, I mean essentially, you know, you as a citizen, you're able to participate in the scientific enterprise by collecting data, you know, on your phone of your bird sightings, pictures of birds, you know, audio recordings of birds, and uploading them to eBird.org. That data is used by um, by different, you know, ornithologists, ornithologists, and other scientists to um, understand bird populations and um, you know migration patterns, and also help with conservation efforts, like for example, for the more endangered or threatened species. And also, too, the app allows you to create, keep a checklist of birds that you encounter during your excursions. And um, as, as a bonus, it's a great way to keep up with how many species you've seen in your lifetime. So you, you, get, you have all of your checklists are available, every single one. You can see them on the website and go through them. And it's, it's great to see what, you know, what you've done and what you've seen, you know, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to add up, especially if you travel. You can, you can do it abroad, too, and that really helps out with, you know, the data that they get. And they use that data for really good things. I think it's a very important um, you know, enterprise and it makes birding even more exciting because you're, you're contributing to the you know, larger, you know, you know, to a scientific enterprise too. So it's great. You get to be a part of it. And um, let's see. So there was, a, there was an eBird e tutorial video, but instead of that, I can just, I can just show you eBird and what I'm, what I'm talking about. So one moment, I'm going to share that. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Great, so let me go back to the home page. So I'll just give you an example of like, um, for example, my, my eBird page. So if I go to the My eBird tab, it gives, it gives me, it, it tells me everything I've done so far. You know, I've observed 81 species. I've completed 72 checklists, you know, 21 species with photos. And it kind of has a list of my latest checklists. Hmm. And you know, by region, you know, I've only been in the Western Hemisphere, but hopefully, you know, I can I can travel abroad to different locations too and see some birds there. So it just gives you a full rundown of just all of the different things. I mean, if you click on species observed, it just tells you, you know, what what you, what you saw when you first saw it, where you saw it, all that information is available, which is it makes it, it makes it really fun and it gives you it gives you a sense of like, wow, you're really, you're really making some progress. And there's some there's some hardcore um, e-birders on here, and it, it, and it can get competitive at times because for example, um, let me see if I can find the place, the, the place, a place that I normally go to. For example, let's say we'll just say um, Amherst State Park. So I can find myself. Yeah, there I am. So yeah, you, I mean, you're on, you're on a list of with other people that, that have seen birds at a certain location. You can kind of look like, okay, this, this person has seen, they saw a lot that day. I'm going to go there too, or I'm going to, I'm going to beat them. I'm going to find more birds than they did. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, it, it can get competitive. I mean, some people are like, some people like, you know, this guy. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'll ever be there, I guess maybe in retirement, but some people are really, really fine. You know, they know how to find a lot of birds and they, they really go all out and, you know, seeing as much as they can. The interesting thing about it is, though, I mean, as tempting as it is to cheat the system, if, if you start reporting birds that, that aren't normally found in the area, you'll, you'll actually, someone actually reach out to you and they're going to want more evidence to confirm that, like audio evidence or photographs. So, so yeah, there, there are controls on preventing people from uh, putting in fraudulent information, which I think is pretty good. But yeah, that's, a, that's kind of a look at eBird and, you know, how useful it is in, in birding. All right, so I'm just going to to move on let me share my powerpoint again all right so next i'm just going to quickly cover some uh you know common north american bird species this is a pretty this is a pretty popular one i mean i'm pretty sure people have seen cardinals um, you know that you know that you know they're known by you know this is a very common songbird it can be distinguished by its you know striking red color, you know pinkish bill and it has that pointed crest. Um, these actually so these birds don't really migrate they they stick around so you'll you'll see them in the winter time too. You know so it's, it's really nice. You know funny thing is it's you know cardinals are known to fiercely fight their own reflections and windows and car mirrors. It's kind of you know, look up videos of that. There's a lot of videos of that happening. 
and um, you know, largely feeds on seeds and insects. So it's a bird, it's a bird you could you could attract to a feeder if you have one in your backyard. They're really, really common backyard feeder birds. So next we have, a, here's a picture of the female. You know, the female's not bright red, kind of has more of a tan beige color. Still has a little bit of the reddish colors there. It has the beautiful crest and you know, the pinkish bill. So that's, kind of, that's how you can kind of tell them apart. The male's striking, you know, male's reddish, the female's kind of more toned down colors, which still has those, you know, red, you know, About the catbird, you know, the catbird may not be very colorful necessarily, but um, it makes up for that lack of color with its very, very, you know, colorful personality. It's a, you know, it's a very talkative bird. It prefers, you know, you know, thickets and um, underbrush. And you know, interestingly, its bird song can last um, up to ten minutes, and it's like ten minutes of just kind of chaotic, all over the place bird song. And you know, its name refers to the cat-like muse that it makes during it when it makes its bird calls. You you heard those. And it mostly feeds on um, insects and berries. So if you have any like wild berries in your backyard, you may attract some uh, cat birds. They love those. Next, we have my favorite. That's the uh, black cap chickadee. Um, it's you know it's arguably one of the um, most uni universally liked birds because of its uh, you know gentle gentle nature and curiosity. You know they're they're so curious that they'll and, and bold around humans that they'll actually eat food out of your hands, especially during the winter time when you know they're really really hungry. They'll, they'll, eat, you know, they'll eat bird seed out of your hand. And the fun fact about them is that they're, they're capable of memorizing thousands of foods, food hiding places. So they're really good at hiding seeds and have, they have different type of caches. So they, they're pretty good at memorizing that. And they're one of the easiest birds to attract to your feeder. Just, you know, put out, you know, sunflower seeds or um, sack flower. They're, they're bound to show up. They even eat peanuts in the shell. So they're pretty, um, pretty cool bird. Next, um, you know, we have a really, really, you know, a beautiful bird here. So it's a blue jay, kind of, um, kind of like, the, you know, the bully of the birds. It's going to be pretty aggressive, pretty, you know, noisy bird, but I like blue jays. Um, you know, they're largely found in the uh, eastern, the midwestern states. In, in, the, um, in the west, um, there's another jay called Stellar's jay. So it's kind of a difference there. You won't see blue jays as much. Um, the blue jay can be kind of a trickster because it knows how to mimic um, certain hawk calls and it uses that sometimes to deceive other species and that's how it happens at the bird feeder sometimes they'll make a hawk call so all the other birds will fly away and then they can take advantage of the food there so yeah blue jays yeah that's it, it'll probably be one of your easiest birds to identify by sound because they're constantly making noise they're, they're, their call is constant it's loud you, you, you'll definitely that's it'll just, it'll just be one of the easiest birds for you to identify and it's still very conspicuous too the blue jay blue jay um it's not a humble bird by any measure Yep, and the oldest known blue jay, which was which was it was banded and it had a band on it, and um, was like 26 years old, which is a pretty pretty long time for a bird. Yes, you know, stubborn bird. All right, so next we have another one of my favorites, um, the white the white breasted nuthatch. It, um, this so this is actually a bird that um tends to tends to be in this in um sort of interspecies colonies with the black capped chickadee because they eat similar foods and like the chickadee, you know the um. You know, the uh, white-breasted nuthatch is very gentle and extremely curious around humans. It'll, it'll also eat, you know, seeds from your hand, too. And they're called nuthatches because they, they have a habit of, um, like, jamming large nuts into, the, like, an acorns into the bark of the tree, and then they hit it with their bill repeatedly to, until the nut hatches out. So, hence their name, uh, nuthatch. So, they have, a, they have a pretty nice technique there. And so the, so the male has a, a black cap you know, on its head, you know, kind of a black mark, whereas the female has a bluish gray one. So we have a female here. Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, the cool thing that it's doing here is um, they, they're able to like walk down trees upside down. You'll see them doing that a lot, which is pretty amazing. They're really agile. You'll see them all you know, upside down on branches, walking upside down on trees. They're really, really, really agile. But you know, we have the female here. And on the next slide, we have the male, distinguished by the black cap here. So next we have uh, the great blue heron, very, very large bird. Um, you know, it, it's a you know, great blue heron is a bird you'll see around marshes or ponds, and you'll see it, you know, you know carefully walking and looking down, and you know, as, as it patiently hunts either fish, amphibians, you know, reptiles, small mammals, insects, and even you know, even like small birds. So it has a pretty pretty broad um, diet. Although these birds move really slowly, they have a lightning fast strike that they make with their um their their dagger like bill. 
And, you know, despite their large size, they only weighed like, you know, five to six pounds because they have, you know, birds have hollow bones. So makes it easier to fly. So next we have the uh, red-winged blackbird. And the red-winged black blackbird is one of the most um, abundant, you know, bird species in North America. And it's, it's known for its uh, vibrant wing patch here. And, you know, male red-winged blackbirds tend to have, you know, up to like 15 uh, female mates. So it can, it can be pretty aggressive when it comes to, you know, mating and being territorial. And, you know, these birds, um, they mainly eat insects and seeds in the summertime. And during the wintertime, they, they switch to corn and wheat. And, you know, here's the male here. And on the next slide, we have the female. So more of a brown, streaky color. And um, every now and then you'll see a female with a red patch, but it's not as pronounced as the male's, um, you know, red patch. Usually, usually it turns out that like the uh, the male species tend to be more colorful, but some, there's some times where it's in the reverse. There are some rare instances where the female is more colorful. So, um, so that's actually actually concludes the um, you know, the presentation. Um, and now, now I'm going to open it up to a, a Q and A session. I know I throw a lot of information at you, so I'm pretty sure there's some questions that you guys have. Well, that's great. Anybody can unmute and, and ask your questions. Um, and let's see, do you want to, oh, somebody's unmuted. Do you want to stop sharing so we can see everybody or what would yeah, you like? Me, okay. Let me stop sharing. Um, I was wondering about uh, the uh, binoculars. I, I bought one. Uh, I bought a really nice uh, pair, I think, at a, a yard sale. but. Mm -hmm. Are the, are the numbers that you said written on the binoculars somewhere? Yes, yeah, they can, they can be found in the binoculars. Um, for example, um, let me see, usually like, for, like mine are on the, on the, let's see, so mine are like right here on the side here. Sometimes they're in the middle, sometimes they're in the middle portion. It, it varies, but they'll definitely be written on the binoculars. That was wonderful seeing all those pictures of birds. <laughs> it was just Thank you. I wish I could. I wish the audio would have worked better. That would have made it better. But I'm glad. I'm glad I added the pictures because I kind of made up for it. Are those all your photos, Skylar, that you were showing us of the birds? Yep, they're all photos that I've taken, you know, in Western New York. The same for the videos too of the bird songs and the bird calls. Do the hawks bother the bird feeders very much? Oh, like, um, so I'm glad you asked that. I did have a hawk, a red-tailed hawk visit my bird feeder once, but um, it hasn't been back since. So that's the thing about having a bird feeder. You know, the hawks will get wise, like, and say, hey, this is where the birds are coming to, and they'll, they'll stake it out for a while. And if you, if you want to prevent that, you, you, you can take down your bird feeders and kind of wait it out, and then the hawks will move on to another location. How many bird feeders do you have? Let's see. One, two three, four, I'd say, I'd say uh, five, wow. yeah, five, and I have a, I have a tall bird feeder pole, mm -hmm. and I and have, you get specific seed when you're wanting to look at specific birds, that's right, that's right, yeah, I use specific seeds to attract specific birds, because it, depending on what seeds you put out, you may get birds that you don't want, which, because there's some birds that will that will dominate, like for example, European European starlings, uh, grackles, and house sparrows. They tend to dominate bird feeders. So you, you want to strategically put out food so that they won't they, they won't scare away the other birds that you may want to see, like goldfinches or chickadees and cardinals. Do you use any niger? I haven't used it yet, but um, that's that's something I'm thinking about using for um for attracting the uh, goldfinches for sure, because I know that house sparrows don't eat that. We didn't hear what that last question was. Oh, could you repeat the question, Skylar? The do you use what did we didn't hear what the person asked? Was it um Niger? Yes. Niger. Yeah, I I, I haven't started using it yet, but I I'm, I'm really thinking about it because I have a right now I have a house sparrow problem, and I know that they don't eat that, so I need to need to start putting that out so I can just get the the goldfinches. Do you have to worry about bears coming to the bird feeders? Thankfully, that, that hasn't happened. Um, the, the, the biggest thing that's come to the bird feeder was actually a white-tailed deer. Oh. <laughs> but I, but I, haven't, I haven't seen her since. She, only, she, came one, she came by once and she ate a lot of the seed and I haven't seen her since, so. Is there a way to stop cardinals? And, and I think a, a hummingbird did it. Uh, 
from banging themselves into the gla a glass window? I think there is. I think there are certain types of um, maybe um, covers that you can put in your windows or objects that help that help them understand that it's not a surface that they can go through. Yeah, I don't know the exact products, but it would be worth looking up. Um, I guess window covers or window type um, type devices that help birds, you know, distinguish the you know the window so they can know that it's a window, it's a wall. Because yeah, that that is an issue. Actually, the cardinals survived all right but uh, there were two dead birds on the deck. One was a hummingbird and one was a, a little dark gray something. Mm -hmm. And is that likely to have come from uh, throwing themselves against the window? It could be. Um, do, you, do you have bird feeders? No. Okay, I was wondering, because sometimes I tell you not to put your feeders too close to windows, kind of keep them away from windows to kind of reduce the likelihood of them you know, colliding like that. Do you have any trouble with uh, blue jays unloading your feeder? <laughs> actually, actually, I don't. Um, so, so, so another thing about my feeder is um, one of one of my I have, I have a tube feeder that's encased in a cage, so so larger birds can't get in. So that one's exclusively for smaller birds, because otherwise I'd have problems with blue jays. I have problems with uh, grackles. So. So yeah, blue, blue jays aren't much of a problem. If I, I have a feeder exclusively for them that I feel with shelled peanuts. So they have their own feeder, so they're not dominating. And Because I know blue jays tend to bully other birds, so I, I kind of make sure they have their own thing too. We, we live in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, this fall uh, we I have enjoyed thousands of starlings that fly in formation, and they all line up al along the electrical wires. I mean, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, yeah, usually in the evening, particularly cool evenings. Ha have you seen any of those in, in Buffalo where you are and do starlings uh, migrate? Yeah, I've actually, I've actually seen them in, um, in Buffalo. I see, yeah, I see starlings quite a bit and I know what you're talking about. If anyone's, and I'm pretty sure, um, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's a, it's a really incredible sight. Seeing hundreds of starlings in the sky flying together in what seems like a, a, choreogra a choreographed motion yeah, but, but with, with starlings, so yeah, we, I, I see quite a few of those, and um, I'm, I'm not too sure about their migration patterns, but I do know that they get a sort of a bad rap because um, they're, they are an invasive species, and they tend to dominate when it comes to like nesting cavities and other birds. Like, for example, the state bird of New York is the eastern bluebird, but it's, it's kind of, it's, you, you, don't, you don't really see it as much because it has to compete against not only starlings, but also competes with uh, house sparrows, too, which is another um, invasive species. So, I, I like starlings, though. They're pretty interesting. I mean, they can actually um, mimic human voices. So you should, you should watch some videos of it. They can actually <laughs> mimic human voices pretty well and they mimic other birds too. I had a, a house that was glass all the way around and uh, lived near the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway. And there was um, ducks, flying ducks and they would ram into the glass because, you know, they probably saw themselves. And I mm -hmm. was worried, and I called uh, up, and they says, just leave them. You know, I didn't know. They, they were just hit so hard that sometimes it would just knock them out. And they told me just to leave them alone, and they'll get out of their days and, you know, go about their business. Wow. How um, often would that happen? Another thing, too. Uh, uh, do, you, uh, do you feed them? your birds and all year long in the um, winter and summer yes yeah but I, I have to switch it based on the time of year like um during the like for example during the um the fall and winter try, i try to put out more high protein foods like like suet or um you know roasted safflower just stuff the stuff they because they need more nutrients during the winter time so just kind of switch it up based on the time of year Uh, every now and then I see a real small goldfinch on my bird feeder as opposed to a regular size. Is that just a juvenile or are there different subspecies? So you see a, you see a really small goldfinch on your, um, your feeder? Yeah. Does and it have I'm any... if it's a juvenile. It could be a juvenile. I mean, is it, a, is it a more of a pale yellow? Uh, it looks sort of like a regular goldfinch in color, uh, but uh, it just seems to be small. It could be a juvenile or it could be an, like another species. It could be um, 
maybe a yellow warbler or or maybe um, there's, a, there's, a, there's another goldfinch called a lesser goldfinch. It could be that too. Yeah. But yeah, and, that, and that's where I think the uh, the birding I, the birding um, ID app would come in handy. Just so if you're able to get a picture and um, use that app, be like, okay, that's what that is, because it shows you pictures of females, adults, juveniles, or immature, even non-breeding. Because certain non-breeding birds have a different look to them. That's very different. Those are amazing uh, websites that you told us about that eBird and um, Cornell just a, they do such a fabulous job and it really enhances your your birding experience. So I'm so glad you shared those. And they're, and they're somebody, free. Yeah, and they're free. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah, we, we had a totally white uh, hummingbird that came and fed at our feeder. And I, I wonder, you think it was an albino or you think it was just a juvenile? It may have been a, it may have been an albino, I think, um, because uh, I'm trying to think. Because a common hummingbird is the, um, I think, the ruby-throated hummingbird, but it's, it's not impossible for there to be al albinos. I know albin albinism happens in um, the bird kingdom too. Yeah, it would have been nice to see a picture of that. Mm. Any other, um, you know, questions or comments? It's so fun to to hear about birds and to talk about birds and have your bird feeder. And um, one of the things, Skylar, I really appreciate about your presentation and what you do is that you go out and you see birds that we don't see around our feeders as well. Um, and uh, if you haven't, if you, if you have an Instagram um, account, I don't know if it's like sort of Facebook, but it's photos. That's where I, I first found Skylar. I kind of mm -hmm. stalked him. <laughs> and um, it paid uh, off. It really, yeah, it really did. Um, and I said, hey, would you share with us? So um, you're, there's a hashtag, um, Black Birders Week. And that's how I, I met Skylar. And there's all kinds of um, birders from all over the world posting these amazing things. And Skylar, um, I'll put your, in the chat, I'll put your hashtag or your, it's also on our webpage, but you go as the elusive black birder with little mm -hmm. hyphens. Oh, you did it. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, you could, you know it better than I do. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, that's why I post my pictures of, uh, of birds, pictures, videos, and also I take pictures of other things like chipmunks and groundhogs. But in what, what distinguishes yours uh, from a lot of other people's are the fun facts that you put. So it's a, it's a, just a wonderful time to see these beautiful birds and to know you took the photos and then you have these great facts about them. So I really appreciate it. You've yeah, definitely yeah. expanded my horizons. Yeah, every picture I take and I post on there, I always put a description, like a fun fact about the bird that, that kind of makes it even more interesting. Yeah. Well, Skylar, thank you so much for a really outstanding- Very inspiring. You, you have uh, inspired me to pursue a new hobby. So you yeah. have, you, you have uh, expanded my worldview and thank you for that. You're welcome. That's, that's a thing. If I, even if I only converted one person, I'd be I'd be happy. <laughs> Two. Two. There Two. We Do Thank I have three? You. There we go. Five. Five. Nice. nice. Very nice. Yeah, you know, you converted me. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Sorry. Thank you all welcome. for coming. Right. Thank you for coming. Right. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Bye, bye guys. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. No problem.